Amina Mahal, Nakaviga, this is all my Filipino, I'm sorry. My dear friends, first of all, before starting my reflection, I would like to thank you and uh, to show my gratitude to the Cardinal, uh, may I say, Cito, to the Cardinal Cito Tagle for this invitation. He invited me already years ago for the first uh, meeting. I could not come and I was very sorry. But now for the fourth, here I am, and I'm very grateful because uh, this is uh, a great experience of faith to see all of you in this uh, enthusiastic movement for the new evangelization. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your witness that you give to all the world because uh, my presence uh, in uh, this moment in Manila is uh, for me an occasion to learn for you and uh, to be once around the world a mediator of your experience of new evangelization. Second, I am a little confused because when I saw PCLE, I thought that this was Pontifical Council for New Evangelization. <laughs> now you stole my Pontifical Council and when I go back, every time I will see PC and E, I will say, I will think, Philippine Conference of New Evangelization. <laughs> what should I do now? I should change the name of the Pontifical Council. <laughs> now, my dear friends, the community of believers was on one heart and one soul. It is important that we examine closely this account of the evangelist Luke for why he write these pages of the Act of the Apostles, narrating the story, the story of the first community, he is also thinking of those of us who would read this account and who are called to make this world the rule of our faith. Repeatedly, Luke notes that the proclamation of the apostles led to the growth of those who adhere to the gospel. The more the word was proclaimed, the more the number of disciples grew. However, the growth of the disciples was not only numerical. The indication immediately provided by the evangelist underscores the style of life that characterized the disciples. They were of one heart. This signifies that they live the unity and communion that Jesus himself has them as a recognizable sign that they may all be one. However, if we look more closely at our text, we will discover something else. The expression, they were one heart, and one soul inserted between two supporting pillars. 
The first is prayer, which provides the courage to announce the word of God. The second is the declaration that everything was to be shared among them and that nobody would be left in need. Here we are provided with a milestone by which we may measure how to be one heart and one soul and how to make such communion a concrete sign of new evangelization. Let us not forget, my dear friends, that uh, after Peter's discourse of Pentecost, the first community began to see the fruits of his preaching. Here we are offered an extremely meaningful picture. I quote, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communion life, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. They came upon everyone and made wonders and signs were done to the apostles. All who believed were together and that had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They take their meals with exaltation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. As we can see, described in words are the essential elements necessary for the life of the Christian community. Teaching, prayer, sharing, joy, simplicity, all of which become testimonies by which the disciples make visible in their lives the very announcement that they make by words. This is not enough to take words. We need also deeds. Nevertheless, this fact is not appreciated by the leaders of the people who, after Peter and John healed the crippled man at the beautiful door of the temple of Jerusalem, as you remember. So these leaders called the apostles before the Senate, and having no reason to punish them, threatened that they no longer preach in the name of the Lord. We know the response given by Peter and John. Whatever it is right in the sight of God for us to obey you rather than God, you be the judges. But it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. We cannot keep in silence. This is the first provocation which touches us even today. When one met Christ, one cannot keep the joy to oneself. It is necessary to share this joy and allow others to participate in it without extinction. There is no, my dear friends, there is no danger, there is no threat that can stop the disciples of Christ from sharing the joy of the gospel to everyone. It is here that we find the first prayer composed by the apostles. You know, this is very strange. We know the prayer that Jesus taught us, but do we know the prayer made 
by the apostles, by the first community, is this one. In this occasion, just before, before the expression one heart and one soul. And this is the prayer. Just a while. Luke recount that after Peter and John had been released by the leaders, they went to their brothers. Immediately they went to the brothers. To do what? To recall everything that happened to them. This simple annotation is very significant. The same is true for the disciples and the Emmaus. After they recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread, you remember? They set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them. It appeared clear that Luke does not want us to forget the reference to the community in each moment of our life. Well, after the story of Peter and John, the community prays with these words. Now, Lord, take note of their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with all boldness as you stretch forth your hand to heal and signs and wonders are done to the name of your holy servant Jesus. This is the first prayer. Lord, grant us able to announce your word. After this prayer, once again, Pentecost, the text says immediately, as they prayed, the place where they were gathered shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Great. Here lies the first pillar toward being a true community of faith and evangelization. Prayer is a condition for evangelization. Pope Francis recalled to us this point in several occasions. But yet there is one expression that I love very, very, very much. Because it's an expression which is uh, synthesized, is a thought on this uh, topic. Evangelization is done, first of all, kneeling. Beautiful. I cannot find another expression so great. Evangelization, first of all, is made kneeling with prayer. We come now to the second pillar, sharing. No disciple can think that we, that what we receive can be kept for ourselves. Everything is to be shared so that nobody will be left suffering. Act of the apostles. There was no needy person among them. For those who owned property or houses would sell them, bring to the proceeds for sale, and put them at the feet of the apostles. And they were distributed to each according to need. 
It is here, however, that it is necessary to recall the twofold example given Barnabas and Ananias with his wife, Sophia. The first, whose name means son of encouragement, Barnabas sold his field and placed the money at the feet of the apostles, taking on fully the title of evangelist along with Paul. But the second, Ananias, wanting to retain something of the proceeds for himself and the wife, was reduced to lying and dying. My dear friends, the teaching is profound. Those who do not give have no life within them. Without love, which is a complete sharing, there is no true life. Pope Francis teaches us, if and when you have time, please read the message of our Pope Francis for the next first World Day for Poor. This is a very important teaching on sharing and encountering the other. In this teaching, we seek to understand how essential it is for us to grow in faith by being of one heart and one soul. There is a beautiful ancient writing indicating the way I quote, do you not see opposite to you a great tower built upon the waters of splendid square stones? For the tower was built square by those six young men who had come with her, but myriads of men were carrying stones to it, some dragging them from the depths, or they were removing them from the land, and they handed them to these sick young men. They were taking them and building, and those of the stones that were dragged out of the depths, they placed in the building just as they were, for they were polished and fitted exactly into the other stones and became so united one with another that the lines of juncture could not be perceived. And in this way, the building of the tower looked as if it is well made by the one stone. From the biblical tradition, the remain covered within us the memory of the construction of the Tower of Babel. Babel is the sign of division among the people caused by their pride to attempting to reach God. On the contrary, this new tower, the passage is from a book with the title The Shepherd of Hermas. You know, my friends, Shepherd of Hermas, this uh, small book is uh, a vision many visions in this book. And it was written in the first half of the second century, 
just, just at the end of the Gospels, and we have new books, new literature, and this, this, the, the, the Shepherd of Hermas, belongs just the first writing that we, we have. So, in this passage, we can see another tower. The first was made by man. This one is made by man, Rine, born again from the waters. The first was made on the land, this second on the water. The first sign of division, the second one expression of unity. It is interesting, you know, when, uh, when we heard each stone so united with the other that could not see anymore the, uh, the, the line of chapter. This tower, my dear friends, represents the church. The church receives from the, her origins the strength from the water of baptism. It is from there that she is constructed. Far from the water of baptism originates the entire sacramental life and the new life of Christian Christians as a children of God. The stones are we, the believers, who have been taken from the water, fitted together in such a way that no one can no longer distinguish one rock from the other. This is the Church of Christ. She is the image of a construction that is not yet complete and yet which nevertheless is distinguished by her profound communion and the unity. Her strength consists in that each stone is made for the other in such a way that occupying its unique place, no one is able to feel isolated or useless. On the contrary, each stone is a necessary and indispensable element for the solidity and the harmony of the tower. When there is in our communities the sense of complementarity, there is no more jealousy. The sense of complementarity that we are, each of them, I have something you have not, but you have something that I have not. Complementary. Because complementarity is, is a condition for unity. Well, this passage from uh, uh, the Shepherd of Hermas melts into the vision of Peter and completes it. Come to him a living stone rejected by human beings but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And uh, like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Now, dear friends, another step. Be patient with me today, but another step. Without the mission, there is no church. On this point, we must always be very radical, very clear. Jesus Christ willed and created the church in order that the gospel of salvation may reach all people. But this implies the awareness of a community which grows 
in its knowledge of the Lord. And in the light of this, lives with a commitment to communicate it to all. Mission, evangelization, is an intrinsic element of our pastoral activity and at the same time becomes the criteria by which to judge the efficacy of our pastoral endeavors. Without the strain towards mission, the church loses her strength and falls into the temptation of standing alone within herself, her structures, no longer possessing the passion for proclamation which truly makes her the body, the spouse of Christ. Within this context, it may be useful to take once again into our hands a parable of Jesus that uh, addresses the work that we are called to do as uh, new evangelizers. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual day wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you too go into my vineyard and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, the, the hours of work was until six o'clock. So five o'clock, one hour before, he found the order standing around and said to them, why do you stand here hide all day? And they answered, and because no one has hired us. He said to them, you two go into my vineyard. We stop at this point of the parable. We want to reflect just a while to grasp its meaning. I would like, my dear friends, if someone is able to paint it, so to make a, an icon of this parable and to put it on the main door of our church, so entering in our communities, so do we, or, or, or the window, I don't know, but don't forget to, to paint this parable because this can be probably an expression for the new evangelization. We take some points from the parable. The first the scene describes a landowner who recognizes his need for workers. He cannot do it alone. He needs others because the vineyard is so large and there is more than enough work for everybody. we can identify each believer as the subject who is aware of the great amount of work in his territory, in his parish, and of the need for many to participate in the work of evangelization. In order to accomplish this, one must not be closed in upon oneself, but must go out and above all, recognize the need for others. 
There is a second thing. A number of people seeking work. They are in the piazza waiting for someone to meet them and to invite them to work in the vineyard. This is not far from our situation. Many, many are waiting to receive from us an authentic invitation to share in our work. In recent years, it seems like the sense of belonging reappeared in a new way, and we should be aware of that. The sense of belonging, not to be alone, is the profound need of many of today not to remain alone. Solitude is one of the first diseases today. It is important, however, that people are involved based upon their skills and talents and for the desire that they cherish to give of their time in a manner that is closer to their heart. One of the challenges facing our communities today is to identify a differentiated list of tax tasks that are able to involve people in areas of their life in which they are most committed. From this perspective, it is good to examine another element of the power. The laborers are invited to work in the vineyard for a period of time during the day, not all the day, a period. It would be unrealistic for our community as well as its leader not to recognize the demands that contemporary social life imposes on one's amount of work and commitments. While it is true that being a Christian has neither price nor set hours, the request to work in the community must correspond to the real possibilities of the faithful, always being aware that their gracious commitment is a sign of their growth in faith, which takes time. We cannot have immediately everything. We need to be patient, patient, step by step. The evangelization is made step by step. The parable teaches that uh, it is necessary to leave the house and to enter the piazza. However, we are not to remain there, for that is not our place. But we are there in order to invite others to enter the vineyard. A community, my dear friends, should not slavishly copy what other institutions are doing. The task that we have is different. People desire from us something essential. If one longs for something ephemeral, he or she should remain in the piazza, where they probably would find things better organized. We, we propose 
the answer to the meaning of life. Know how to pass a joyful an hour. We ask for a commitment, not a past time. I think that this is important for us. We give an answer to the sense of life, and this is the answer given by the gospel. It is also interesting to note at the end that in the parable, the landowner goes out several times during the day to look for more worker for his vineyard. This repeated action has its own particular meaning. Equally interesting is the conversation between the landowner and the workers of the last hour. The parable doesn't say that they have not desired to work. A different answer is given. No one has hired us. While many people pass by, it seems that nobody noticed that they are workers waiting to be invited. What humiliation, my dear friends, for these workers. They were asking work, a job, and no one gave to them. How they could go back at all. The dignity of the worker, the dignity, human dignity. If there is no job, if there is no work, there is no dignity at all in this world. We should remember that because this is a part of our evangelization. What humiliation. But we learn the tenacity with which we must unceasingly enter into the piazza and also that the time devoted to the work in the vineyard can only be judged by the landowner. Certainly, those who arrive in the vineyard in the earliest hour must make sure to complete the work entrusted to them. All the while, not judging, not judging those who arrive on the last hour. Now, another step. We are going to the end. Another why. Are you tired? Oh, such a lie. <laughs> well, the church, my dear friends, the church became became visible on the day of Pentecost. From that moment, she possessed the strength to establish herself in a world as a witness to the resurrection of the Lord. As Jesus inaugurated his public mission with the preaching of conversion and forgiveness, so also the church proclaims conversion and faith in the risen Lord. The division of power, consequence of sin, is destroyed by Pentecost, which to the spirit brings forth unity. It is the Holy Spirit who gives strength to the disciples to open the locked doors of the cenacle behind which they huddled for fear and list them for the mission of evangelization. As the Spirit accompanied Jesus, the same Spirit now accompanies His Church. 
blessing our being in church today under the action of the Holy Spirit is not merely an exercise of piety, but it is the necessary condition for giving back to him all that we he the all that he expects. Our evangelization will only be fruitful to the extent to which we are docile to the action of grace which shapes our hearts and minds, which place, places upon our lips the right words which people may hear, and above all, which opens the hearts of those to whom we are speaking to help them receive our announcement in a coherent way. But what are we to announce to those whom we invite? I will answer nothing other than the center and the foundation of our faith. We announce the resurrection. The first element which we are bringing, which is decisive for personal and communal existence, is that we are always placed before God who gives life. The removal of this reference creates the space for disproportion and one is no longer able to understand neither the role nor the mission that we are called to undertake. It is not by coincidence that the text of the first Corinthians 15 constitutes the first profession of faith formulated by the Christian community, and of which Paul felt the duty to call simply the gospel, received and transmitted. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that it appears to Cephas and the apostles and the twelve. What the church has the duty to announce always and everywhere is the event which transformed the world. Jesus is risen. Jesus is still alive. Live among us. It is not this reason, it is for this reason that the disciples to the mouth of Peter said for us it is impossible not to speak. In short, we are called to make ours the words of St. Paul. I believe, therefore, I spoke. We too believe, and therefore, we speak. Following what we described, it's impossible now to journey along a small path for the evangelization. my humble opinion, it is necessary above all that we reclaim the way of spirituality. Particularly today, this is seen as the condition permitting one to return 
to the very depth of oneself. Above the noise, the frustrations, and the contradictions encountered each day, the words of St. Augustine, do not go outside of yourself, but return into yourself. This become the principal road to follow the Lord in the way of contemplation, for which one has a strong longing. The same, the words of Saint Anselm. Enter into the seal of your mind. Shut out everything except God and whatever helps you to seek him once the door is shut. My Lord, teach my heart where and how to seek you, where and how to find you. It's beautiful. Oh Lord, teach me how and where to seek you to find you. God teaches us how to do it. My dear friends, four men of today immersed in a fleeting pleasures, it is necessary to restore an authentic rapport with oneself, to a rediscovery of silence and the listening. The importance of silence in our life. Moreover, our proclamation must be made visible in that which we have as the culminating expression of our faith. The life of communion of which we are witnesses. It is uh, the theology of St. John, which more than any others insists on this dimension. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. The reference of Jesus to the Eucharist is immediate. Food and drink are the body and blood of Christ. Those who desire life must be fed by body and blood of Christ. The reception of life, therefore, comes about through union with Christ. And this is achieved to sacramental union. In a world, in the, sacram in the sacraments, we enter into a very dynamic of the life of God in self, which is life of communion by excellence. What we take from this teaching, above all, is an emphasis on the permanence of communion. To remain, to remain. That means a unique union with the Lord. It's not just a moment. We remain. He remains with us. Communion becomes the very place in which the community of disciples finds its fulfillment and its reason for being. But the path of communion is the principal road by which our communities are credible today in the moment in which we rediscover the missionary dimension promoting a spirituality of communion in times. Living the communion in the conviction that the charity of deeds renders concretely the charity of words. It is necessary to expand the space of communion in order to progressively discover the way of the true communion that has in the Trinity its most 
Eastern. It's a most pure and genuine icon. But this meaning means recognizing that those towards who we are going are brothers and sisters for whom we are responsible. It means leaving open one's heart and making room for the other, knowing how to be his or her burden. At this point, another element marks our life is taking responsibility for the other. Love requests responsibility. In time like ours, often characterized by the closing in of the individualism without the possibility of relationship, and where it seems that the delegation is preferred over a direct form of participation, the call to be responsible requires a witness which understands how to care for our brothers and sisters. The responsibility is born of freedom and is nourished by the truth which we profess. It is aroused in us for we have first experienced that God himself is responsible for each of us. I am responsible for the other because God in his love is responsible for me, for all creatures in this world. For this, we can understand the word of St. Paul. None of, none of us lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. Why then do you judge your brother? For you, why do you look down on your brother? Then let us no longer judge one another. If you are responsible for the other, you cannot judge it. Within this context, let me say something for our communities. What are the expressions of a free welcome and which instead are forms of judgments? What are the expressions that the community adopts in order to make everyone feel truly at all? In this community you are at all. Pope Francis teaches us in Amoris Laetitia, our families, the responsibility that we have to form in this small church. It's beautiful. We should go back to this teaching in order to understand better how to live together in communion. At the end, my dear friends, we arrive at the final word in which we both succumb competence in love. What we announce, love. For what? For love. Why? Because God reveals himself as love. When one lives in the world professing faith in Jesus Christ, who died for love, and who in love was resurrected by the Father, one is then shown the path that must be taken. It binds not only, it binds to only one command that becomes the law of existence. 
for even freedom is not superior to love. I can see so many young people and we know that this is the time for you to understand freedom. But my dear friends, freedom is not superior to love. The true freedom derives from love. After all, the fulfillment of freedom consists in placing itself voluntarily in a freedom way at the disposal of life and losing itself in love. Ultimately, nothing is more free than the love that is given without reason, just in a free way, in a free way. Before the sacredness of love is placed the scandal of our presence in the world, in a context in which the civilization and the inflation of love served to nullify the sacredness of it, it is critical that our style of life proposes once again the paradoxical character of our testimony. This is why we are called once again to fix our gaze upon the new forms of poverty afflicting humanity. Besides, is this not our history? In the word of God, is it not we who are to have a constant and unending preference for all those who the world has rejected and considered useless and ineffective, the chronically ill, the dying, the marginalized, the handicapped, and all those who appear in the eyes of the world to be lacking a future and a hope, are to find the commitment of the Christians, our commitment. From this perspective, there truly deserves to be a commitment to a new creativity for charity. One that goes beyond merely recognizing new forms of poverty, but which becomes a sign of hope that knows how to go beyond because the person is placed at the center. The commitment to charity is actually a true way of the Catholic Ecumenate which always we are called to follow. In conclusion, I turn to the words of a great evangelizer of the last century. John Henry Newman, which uh, in his book, The Grammar of a Saint, he wrote this beautiful quotation. Christianity is a living truth which never can go old. Some persons speak of it as if it were a thing of history, which only indirect bearing upon modern times. I cannot allow that it is a mere historical religion. Certainly, it has its foundation in past and glorious memories, but its power is in the present. It is not a very matter of antiquarianism. We do not contemplate it in conclusions 
drawn from damned documents and dead events, but by faith exercised in ever-living objects and by the appropriation and use of ever-recurring gifts. Our communion with it is in the unseen, not in the obsolete. It is precisely so, my dear friends. Jesus Christ does not belong to the past, but to the present, our present, the present of our community. His church, which never Jesus to announce the Christ, know, knows that he need there is the way, the truth, and the life. It is in keeping our gaze fixed upon this mystery of faith that we will always have a need, a, a new world to address to people of today. For we believers, this event is always present. Ever present faith will serve to sustain us in our efforts to renew each day our faith in Him. Those seeking to find Him with a sincere heart must give witness by a style of life which testifies that we have indeed found in him the full and definitive meaning of our life. Salamat po. Thank you very much, Most Reverend Salvatore Vino Fisichella from the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization. At this point, we would like to invite you to join us for a five-minute silence and review.